Hey, Steve Soretsky here. I uh, wanted to put together a quick video uh, on my latest blog. Obviously, there's a link to it below. Uh, it's basically how leverage and debt has fueled real estate growth. So there's a lot of uh, obviously people coming out and questioning. Okay, well, what is what is you know what is driving real estate prices? Is it uh, foreign investment? Is it speculation? Uh, is it limited supply? Is it population growth? The thing is, all of those are a part of it, but they're all symptoms, and they're all symptoms of an underlying disease. And that underlying disease is leverage and excess credit. Uh, there's so much credit in the system. You know, banks banks are just giving out mortgages left, right, and center. There's more and more leverage. Um, you know, your banks are paid. They make money on how many mortgages they give out. So there's every incentive for them to keep lending and lending and lending. And we are in right now a prolonged credit cycle. Uh, you want to know maybe one of the reasons why Canada essentially avoided the 2008 financial crisis. We basically borrowed our way out of it. You know, so did Australia, so did a lot of these other countries. And, uh, and later in this clip, I'm going to introduce you uh, Professor and Economist Steve Keen, who's going to elaborate on this further, explain it to, all, to you. I'm basically pulling a lot of this from him and from some of the research that I've done. Um, you know, whether you're whether you're a local here making eighty thousand dollars in Vancouver or you're a, a foreign investor, at the end of the day, almost every single person requires a mortgage. And as real estate prices go up and up and up, there's more and more leverage required. There's bigger and bigger mortgages, and the banks just keep giving them because prices keep going up and up. And of course, they make money on mortgages. Um, so you have this prolonged credit cycle, low interest rates. Um, and it just it fuels demand and as prices go up and up there's more speculation there's more speculators jumping in they take on more mortgages prices go up more leverage in the system more and more buyers people then don't want to sell because oh my gosh prices are going up maybe I'll hold out six more months and make an extra fifty a hundred thousand uh, dollars you know why sell and so that those are the symptoms of the bubble but again that's all underlying from mortgages from cheap credit um, you know, banks hungry, hungry, hungry to loan. Um, you think that maybe they've tightened. I know I have a client last week that was offered a five-year fixed at 2.39 um, from one of the big banks. So you know, there's they're, they're all they're all fighting each other. They're all trying to give everyone the lowest rate, and uh, they want your business. And this is a prolonged credit cycle um, that eventually, you know, if you look at household debt, if you follow household debt, that will tell you where house prices go up. And so Steve Keen, this economist philosophy is that if you watch household debt, that will show you where real estate prices are going. So household debt in Canada is at $1.67 uh, for every dollar of income you earn. It's the highest it's ever been. In BC, I've got a graph of this again in my blog. In BC, the house, private household debt levels are like this. They're parabolic. Um, and so as these household debt goes up, aka bigger mortgages, more debt, uh, that fuels real estate prices because if you can't get a mortgage, there is no demand. There are no buyers if the banks won't give you a mortgage. Um, but the thing is, they are giving mortgages and they're giving bigger and bigger mortgages. As we've seen, uh, you can, you know, I've shown graphs of this before. The loan to values in not only Vancouver and especially Toronto have absolutely surged over the last couple of years um, because you know incomes are flat and house prices go up, uh, you know, 25, 50 percent. That requires more leverage. And uh, that is all stemmed from credit, and again, all those underlying symptoms of uh, you know speculation, limited supply. Uh, that's all. That's all fueled by by credit. And um, you know. So, anyways, I'm uh, I'm not going to drag this on much longer. I'm going to let uh, economist, um, professor at Kingston University. Um, Steve Keen, who is very, very well respected in the industry, he's kind of shaking things up because he thinks differently than mainstream economists uh, who consistently have been getting it wrong over the last 10 years uh, because none of their models factor in household debt. And Professor Steve Keen puts an emphasis on it and says that it is the only thing. Um, so anyways, I'm going to let you watch this video here. Uh, check back in the next couple days. I'm going to have all the stats for the Vancouver housing numbers for the end of February. Um, but without further ado, I introduce you to Steve Keen. Steve, uh, are we currently sitting uh, at the debt throes of the global monopoly game? What we've seen is massively ramped asset prices mm. um, and uh, it's precarious 
when you look around the world, and you've given this an awful lot of thought. I think uh, what we're all doing is, uh, I described it in my, my book, Debunking Economics, back in 2000. I said the world's turning Japanese. If you know your music, that's got a double, double meaning to it. But uh, what, what does that mean? The Japanese had a property bubble and a speculative bubble in the stock market in the 1980s and to 1990 that they literally termed themselves at the time the bubble economy. That bubble economy burst December 31st, 1989, the Nikkei index peaked at pretty close to 40,000 points. Since that point, the stock markets fell from about 40,000 to as low as 7,000, and house prices have slowly slid down a total of 70% in real terms from 1990 to about one or two years ago, where they started to blip up a bit again. That was all driven by a huge growth of private debt, not public debt. Not the ones that the politicians obsess about, but private debt. And every other country on the planet has followed the Japanese into the same abyss. And England did exactly the same thing. And what it does is the level of leverage drives up house prices, drives up asset prices, works while the debt continues growing because that's adding to demand. But then when the debt stops growing, demand disappears and the economy tanks. And what we have is politicians that are trying to maintain the bubble rather than trying to repair the damage done by the increase in leverage. Why doesn't the political class get it? The government is one of the two ways that the economy produces money. Now, one way is banks lend out more than they get back in repayments, and that lending creates money. And that's a standard banking that's model. A, but the standard banking model comes with the fact that they lend to the households and lend to the firms, and with that money comes a debt obligation you have to service which of course you can get, if you get too much debt, you can't service it anymore, you have a crash. On the government side, the government can create money by spending more on us than it gets back in repayments. If it does that, the amount of money that we have in our bank accounts rises. Now, if they do the opposite and they try to tax more than they spend, the amount in our bank accounts falls. So what you've had is, because the governments believe that they should actually not create money, that's not what they're talking about, they, they said we shouldn't run debt, we shouldn't create money. Let's take money out of the private sector and tell them to create more GDP at the same time. But, but actually impossible. It's actually impossible. What then happens is the, that puts pressure onto the household and sector and the corporations to borrow money from the firms, which they do. The banks are willing to lend that money when you can service it. The main way they've been lending the money is to finance people buying houses. And what you get is this increasing debt drives up house prices, encourages more into the same old circle, and what you get is a driving up of house prices relative to incomes, which works until such time as it exhausts the supply of people who are capable or willing to take on this huge level of debt compared to their incomes. A fraction of the population that has a, a mortgage below the age of 30 is nine times lower than it was 30 years ago. That's meaning that you've got to be... You originally, you've got a good mortgage when you're 20, then 25, then 30, then 35. The demographics are saying, ultimately, nobody can afford to take on that new mortgage. And that's when the whole, not property ladder, but property elevator collapses. A neoclassical economist or neoliberal economist, when yeah. they're modelling the economy, yeah. they don't factor banks' debt or money into any of their models. Did you know that? It is horrifying. It's flabbergasting yeah. at the yeah. same it's time. But people think economists yeah. must be experts on money. Yeah. But what they've done is they've built an excuse in, in their mental framework to say money doesn't matter, so we can model the economy without modelling money yeah. or banks or debt. And right. then what's happened in the meantime, money and banks and debt have driven the entire economy into yeah. an impossible situation. And that's why they didn't see the financial yeah. crisis coming when it was bleedingly obvious when you look at the data. The data they ignore is credit. You did see it coming. Yeah. Um, you've been uh, criticised and praised in equal measure, or probably mm -hmm. not equal measure, but you've taken a fair old kicking for it because, you know... That's people... why I wear a leather jacket. It makes me slightly tougher. <laughs> <laughs> Teflon keen. Um, are you here with a few other predictions? Because you're looking at other countries now. Yeah. And we'd like to know some your thinking about well, who, who next to follow. OK, the, the, there are identified between 9 and 17 countries that have managed to avoid the financial crisis back in 2008 by borrowing their way out of it. Right. Okay, which just means basically when you jump off the cliff it's going to be a higher cliff. And the most obvious one of those is China. China has one way out that China is such a mix of a private and public system that they can slip over from private bubbles to public ones with the drop of a hat or drop of a commissar's hat of course. Uh, but Canada, Australia, Sweden, which I didn't necessarily see there, uh, Belgium, 
actually almost one of the top of the list ones, where they've leveraged their way out of the fight for crisis back in 2008. Uh, Norway's there as well. So a range of countries, some you would expect, South Korea, another one. Mm -hmm. uh, so that between nine and 17 countries have, have got out of the crisis in 2008 by borrowing more, appeared to avoid the crisis, but of course their crunch is coming when their rate of growth of private debt slows down. And that's starting to happen in several of those countries, including Canada right now, and Australia's on the preface, precipice as well. So they are going to finally join what I call the, the walking debt of debt, which are countries like America, Spain, Portugal, England, which all had debt bubbles. They burst and now they're in the aftermath where demand from credit is low and what the authorities are trying to do is restart it from an impossibly high level of private debt already. I would tame the beast of finance. This has all been driven by increasing leverage and it's happened because banks can pretend to lend to you based on your income but they continue changing the ratio. So if you go back to the 1960s, you had to have 30% of the deposit to buy a property. Now, of course, you've had situations where banks are saying, we'll lend you 120%. It, why is it amazing to anybody that's driven house prices up? Mm. Okay. Now, the trouble is when we compete over a house right now, if I was you know, fighting with you for a, a house and we're both on the same income, the one of us would, who would win would be the one who got the high level of leverage. If we had a limit that says banks can only lend, uh, say, 10 times the rental income, the mm. property you and I are both trying to buy, we'd have exactly, we couldn't get any more money, borrowed money than each other. The way to win would be to save more money. That would remove the engine that makes us want to go to the banks to borrow the money in the first place. That's the main thing I'd bring back in to try to, I'd bring that level down over time to force house prices down because Expensive houses don't make a wealthy society, they impoverish it.